Amen. So my plans this week was to hear a sermon on Titus. My plans this week were to hear a sermon on And this morning, Carl, if you're watching this, you'll love this. You'll laugh. This morning, uh, my friend Alan said, hey, I got the slides on Titus. So, <laughs> no, no. If you're looking at the church bulletin, though, you can, uh, you can study for next week because Carl will be back preaching from Titus. Uh, this, this morning, though, we're going to be in the book of Luke. Um, chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. Now, as my wife's told me, you know, backtrack here. Yesterday, about 1.32 o'clock, I get a phone call from Carl. And when I see, I, I knew it was either one of two things. Carl's home or, hey, you got one. And he said, hey, you got one. That's what he said. And I said, yes. He said, yeah, and he told me a few things. And, um, but he's close to being back. So that's, that's the positive thing. But my, my wife, when I told her what I was going to do, she said, I think you've preached about that before. I said, well, it's one of the two that I have. So, so, so that's how it works. It's one of the two I have. So, I, so we do alternate versions of that. Maybe we throw Jonah in this. I don't know. But maybe we'll get into that. But it's going to be the parable of the Good Samaritan. And we're going to talk a little bit about that this morning. So if you have your Bibles, we'll read that. Um, starting with verse 25. It says, just then a lawyer stood up. To test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an end, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And he said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Now, one of the basic facts of human existence is we all experience changes in our moods. My wife will attest to that. For about me, not about herself. But she'll, we all have moods. We, we know that we feel better sometimes. Sometimes we, we don't. We go through states of sadness. We go through states of joy. We go through states of feeling really good, and we feel really bad. Um, grumpiness, which is, seems to be the new thing. Once you, know, you hit a certain age, you start to become the grumpy person. A guy, coworker tells me, says, you appear to be a grumpy guy sometimes. And that's usually when I'm dealing with the uh, thermostat that doesn't seem to work in my building. Um, I get to be grumpy when it's 50 degrees when I get there. I'm kind of grumpy because my arthritis kicks in and I'm just like, don't want to do this. But that's, that's, human, that's human nature. We all experience that. Every single person in this room experiences that mood swings of sorts. Sometimes we we're, we're, want to be on a mission to get things done. Other times we just want to sit around and do nothing. That's what we want to do. That's, that's how we are. At one point in the day, we may feel like being around people, being social. And in, in fact, in compare and contrast, we could compare me and my, my daughter to being social butterflies. That's what my wife says. 
and my son and my wife being, just, just leave us alone, just leave us alone, stand back. But we're all different, we're all different. And that's the thing that we have to come into. Mood swings and just the changes that take place in just who we are, that faces, you know, that, that affects the reality around us, the way we see things. Now, guess what? That's normal. That's normal, that's how, who we're made. Um, that's one of the reasons we experience that is because that's part of emotions. There should be joy and there should be some, some sadness sometimes. It says that in Ecclesiastes, but if we get into that, we can talk about there's a time for all these things. But our moods are used together with opportunities that are presented to us. And these opportunities are all around us every single day. That's the thing. Every single day there's opportunities. All these states of being are being directed by God. And they're all being directed towards the end means. You know, Carl's thing, are you, are you my divine appointment? Are you the person I've been appointed to, to see today? We have to look at it that way. Now, is that a hard thing to, to, to acknowledge when somebody comes up to you and does something to you? That is. We talked about the struggles last week, and this is kind of piggybacking off that. Uh, the net result of this is that we have an effect on all those that are around us. How many times are you around somebody that's upbeat and you start to feel upbeat? And how many times are you around the Debbie Downers or the guys that are, you know, just a, and you start to kind of feel that wearing on you? All of that affects us. God's working behind the scenes and all those to inspire us, and we should be inspiring others. When we have coworkers that are trying to bring us down, we should be trying to lift them up. That's kind of what we're going to get at this morning. So the parable of the Good Samaritan. Well, it addresses the very fact that, that we have an effect on others. The Lord wants that effect to be positive. Too many times it's not. It's negative. The world creeps in and we start to become like the world. We don't become like Jesus. We can come into church. We can get upbeat Sunday morning. We can be, feel pumped up, and I always give the example of going to church camp. After you get done with church camp, you feel like you are just ready to take on the world, and then you get back into the real world, and you start to get, wow, wait a minute. I feel like somebody's kicking you in the shins, trying to bring you down. But we should have the effect on others the way that Jesus wants us. We should be super excited to tell the gospel to others. Um, now, more than likely, as my wife pointed out, you've heard this story before, the Good Samaritan. And as I was doing a series of the, the way I look at Bible stories from being a kid to being an adult, they're different. As a kid, there's one view that I see it, and as an adult, I see it differently. And this story is one I start to see a little differently. Once you start to figure in all the schema that comes from with living, you start to, all this stuff starts to creep in, and all the ways it gets, gets into your mind. Um, so you've probably heard this before. This is one of the most familiar in the Bible. In fact, people that are non-Christians know about the Good Samaritan. They do. Uh, it contains a straightforward message about charity. Now, in this, this story, and it's a short one, the bad are really bad and the good are really good. The Lord shows a stark contrast between the priest and the Levite and the Samaritan. Now, the Samaritan had been a neighbor to him who fell among thieves. Now, we could talk about a lot of things through this parable, because the Lord has put a lot of things into this, and there's a lot of truth in it. For instance, we could talk about the church and how it abandons people, how it loses focus sometimes. We could talk about, you know, about that being demonstrated by the priest and the Levite. They kind of abandon. They abandon somebody that's hurt, somebody that's injured. We could talk about that. We could do a whole sermon on that. In fact, there's been lots of sermons on that. There's been lots of discussions on that in Bible studies and stuff about how we abandon people sometimes, how we, um, we do sometimes more damage than good through our words and through our, our mistaken mission that we're uh, out to do. We could talk about how the Lord came up to set up a new church for anyone who would hear the message of charity. We could talk about that. And another subject could come out of this is the parable is prejudice and its ramifications. We all have prejudice. We all have those things in our, in our mindset, in our emotions. We could spend a lot of time on the basic principle of respect for, for others, no, no matter what nationality they are or personality or how they are or how they dress or 
were they, you know, just anything, who, who their family is, we could talk about that, because we all have those prejudices. Um, but we get into this thing about helping others. What we're going to focus on this morning is a merciful attitude that we should be displaying towards others. And I think many times we don't have a merciful attitude. I think many times we start to have that mindset and then something interrupts it and we get caught off guard and we become like the world. I think that's where we're at a lot of times. And I think that's why we need to pray and we need to study our Bible. We need to repent when we need to repent and we need to be willing to follow the role model that Jesus Christ laid out for us. The Samaritan and the it had the opposite, uh, and, the, and the opposite one is displayed by, by the others in this parable. The, the Samaritan is a role model because of perspective on the needs of another human being. You ever been beat up and need somebody to be your rescuer? You ever been down, out, feeling totally exhausted, like nobody wants to help you? Jesus Christ is our rescuer. And that's pointed out there. I mean, that's, this is the merciful attitude that we should be having towards others that was displayed in this. Jesus was telling people this is, this is what we should have. It even says it in Luke 10, 34 through 35, but a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him and went to him and took care of him. He had compassion on him, and he went to him and took care of him. Now, the lawyer to whom the Lord spoke had asked him this question, Teacher, what do I, shall I do to inherit eternal life? That's in 1025. And the answer that the Lord gave him was by means of a parable. Take care of those around you. Live a life of charity and you will inherit etern eternal life. Now, the question remains, how do we work with the Lord and make sure our effect on other people is positive? How do we do that? What specific direction does he give us to try to make our works positive for the Lord? Because I think many times we struggle with that. We know we're supposed to be out there telling others about Jesus, but we stumble. Heaven and hell are places where there's eternal life, and that's where it's played out. Eternal life in heaven is for those who show genuine compassion for their neighbors, and eternal life in hells for those who don't. Another reason for turning our attention to the spiritual world is because of the stark contrast we see. As in this parable, the good are really good, bad are really bad. In the spiritual world, there is the same is, is not the same ambiguity that we sometimes feel in this world. There is a separation of good people from evil people. Whereas here, we all live together. We live among the lost. We live among people that are not Christians, and we live with Christians. We're, that's the difference. In heaven, we're all around fellow believers. And, you know, on earth, we're not. And that's what this parable is telling us. There's two people that passed by. One that was a priest that decided, no. One that just didn't want anything to do with it. And then one person that decided they had compassion. Just like Jesus had compassion for us. I think we forget that. Parables are taught to make us understand that we, we need to show the same. We need to be following the role model, which was Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, the concept of sharing. There's a teaching about spiritual world which applies directly to this parable of this good Samaritan. It's a concept called sharing. There is sharing of all in heaven with each other and with all. Such sharing goes forth from the two loves of heaven, which are love to the Lord and love towards their neighbor. We should love our neighbor. We should love Jesus. Another teaching expands this by saying heavenly love is such that it wishes what is its own to be another's. That's a hard, that's a hard concept to even get into. Because we are so self-centered that we, we want what's ours to be ours. 
Think of the joy that comes from sharing life together as a husband and wife. This week, um, in fact, Friday, Lacey had Friday off, I had Friday off work. And it was enjoyable going outside and, and being able to do things and work outside with my wife. That's a joy. That's a thing of sharing. Sharing something, getting to just share time together. That's one thing that I enjoy. That that's, comes from a lasting friendship. And that's the thing we should have with our Savior. We should have a relationship. In any relationship, there's a time of sharing. If we don't have a time of sharing with our Savior, we're missing out. If it's only time you're sharing with Jesus and sharing with anything is here at church, you're, you are starving yourself. You are totally roadblocking. If the only time that I ever shared with my wife was, you know, five minutes in the morning, I'm starving our relationship. That is something we do, we've got to understand. But it's about sharing. During that time that we're sharing, we're committed to thinking about the needs of someone else, to hearing their ideas, and just being in their company. We teach our kids to share their toys instead of hoarding them. Being able to sharing, you know, when little, we try to teach them to share their toys, and sometimes that doesn't work out. Sometimes they take their toy and they hit their uh, somebody with it. That's a learning moment. That's something that's a teachable. Sometimes we should be thinking about the stuff we teach our kids about sharing and about caring and be looking at our own lives, looking at how we're per our perspective. Don't, don't do that, and then we're doing the same thing. We see that every day. The Lord used the Samaritan in this parable as a person who expressed this desire. He gave of his time to meet the needs of a traveler left half dead. If we look at the details, we see that he went way above the call of duty. Now, not only did he bandage the guy's wounds, he actually went above and beyond. He got some expensive stuff and, and cleaned the guy's wounds. He, he did stuff that was above and beyond. He didn't just say, okay, I'm going to patch you up, and then I'm just going to leave. I'm waiting for somebody else to come take care of you. He didn't do that. He patched him up. He used some wine and some other stuff, cleaned him up. Then he took him somewhere to recover, and he paid for it. He went above and beyond. I know many times when we stop to help someone, if we even stop to help someone, we do the bare minimum. Here, I'll uh, let you use my phone to call somebody. I'll, we do the, we don't go above and beyond. We're kind of looking for that stopping point. Like, hey, I'll, I'm gonna, I'll help you. Do you need me to call someone for you? And I think we're guarded. I think we feel that we, we're going to be taken advantage of or that we may be harmed. That Samaritan could have felt that way. He could have felt those robbers were laying and waiting for him when he was bandaging up this. He could have felt all those emotions that we feel. But he took time to find an innkeeper, someone to t take care of this, this person that was beaten up and robbed and left for dead. This is a perfect example of the way things work when people are following Jesus Christ. People will thrive. They'll do more than what's expected of people of the world. They're going to step above and beyond. We're going to, there's going to be a noticeable difference. The song is, they know we are Christians by our love. By our love. That's compassion. It's not they'll know we are Christians by, the, by our arms being crossed. And I, I've said this one time when I used to lead singing. You know, when you get ready to sing, sing something like that, they know we are Christians by our love. We sing old hymnals. And there would always be several people out there. <laughs> like, like, yeah. Then getting ready to play a football game, and they're all just got the grimace on their face like they're in pain. But they'll know, they should know that you're a Christian by your love. They should know by the way that you talk, that you're different. You're different. That you're not the same as the world. Of course, in, in all these parables, they show the, show the opposite things as, as well. It demonstrates there's a hellish attitude of selfishness. And that's shown through the callousness of this priest and the Levite. 
They were not the most devious people in the parable. No, that would be the people that were the thieves. That would be the people who were robbers. That would be the people that beat them up, stole their money, beat, beat them up, left them. Those were the, the most horrible. But there was a selfish attitude of the Levite and the priest. Does that reflect the way the world is today? That selfish attitude about me, 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 I, I, I? I think it does. I look around and I see people always looking out for themselves. They, they don't look out for others. In fact, that's a rarity. That's a rarity. People tend to only look out for themselves. And that's kind of a, a sad thing. You find that in churches. Find that a lot of times. People may need help. And we're always thinking of ways to avoid helping people instead of ways to go and help people. Ways to clear our schedule or ways to try to make it work. Um, my wife many times will say that if somebody asks me to do something, I'll go, well, how do you say this? That I'll, I would go build a Taj Mahal before I'll put up trim in our house or something like that. But we should be looking to help others. And that's the thing. That it's the way we approach things. It is the way we approach stuff that we should be looking to help others. The world's going to tell you that you need to look out for yourself first. But Jesus, through this parable, is telling us that we should be looking to try to help people, even if it gets us out of our comfort zone. This teaching goes on to describe this urge to destroy others, to use everything of theirs to satisfy self. You know, that's what the thief did. The man that, you know, was on his way to Jericho and thieves just laid there waiting for him. And they took his clothes, they beat him, they wounded him. That's, that's what happened. And this lawyer says, what shall I do to inherit the eternal, eternal life? Love your neighbor as a Samaritan did. Share your talents and your energies with others. Rid yourself of feelings of superiority and contempt. If you do those things, you will inherit eternal life. You will be following Jesus Christ as your Savior because he will be the focus of your life and not the world. That is how it's going to be. If you start doing these things and following what Jesus is saying, it doesn't mean somebody's not going to come up and beat you, be mean to you. You may not have the best life as far as here on earth but you'll have eternal life which is far greater than anything that's here i said this this past year to someone and i've used this from carl carl brought this up in the sermon but if you are a christian this is the worst it's ever going to be <laughs> this this is the worst it's ever going to be if you're not a christian this is the best it will ever be for you the best and that's a, the that's a concept I don't think many people get. Our preparation for our life takes place in this world. Our preparation for eternal life takes place in this world. And if you don't have that figured out, you need to get it figured out quickly because you'd never know when this could be your last breath. It's easy to be rational sometimes and understand certain things, but... It's when you're talking about the concept of eternal life, that's a hard concept to understand. It's hard. We look at things as that we can live forever. Now, yesterday I was at the VFW's Veterans Day um, service. Had a hundred year old guy there. Amen. He was getting a, getting recognized. They do a thing for several veterans each year. Nice service, very nice. Uh, if you've never had a chance to go to one, I think I think you should go to one. It was a good service. Um, went to it, but the but the hundred year old guy he'd served in World War II. First thing he said when he spoke was, "I thank God for every opportunity I've had in this life to tell others about Jesus." What? <laughs> when you're a hundred. It don't matter. He, he was, he was, and it was, it was one of those things where I thought, but he was, 
And there's people around him hearing, hearing his words. And they were listening. This is a 100-year-old guy, World War II vet. But he's speaking. I think that we, the older we get, the more we start to understand the urgency to tell others about Jesus. I think we start to understand that at a certain point, you know, this, it's going to take your last breath. You get to a certain age and you start doing, you know, doing that. You start to, start to realize. But he, he said that. And I, was, I told Mike Sutherland afterwards, I said, I may use that tomorrow. That guy's a 100-year-old guy speaking the truth. And people, you know, there was probably a couple hundred people there at that service, that thing. And that was, it was one of those moments. He was using that, that venue, that podium of sorts, to spread the gospel, to plant the seed. Um, that's, that's just something that, that I think we don't take advantage of. But we take, this, this is our preparation for life that's going to be eternal takes place here and things aren't so clear here in fact it's hard to be clear here a lot of times it is it's chaos you turn on the news it's it's hard to understand it's hard to see rational thoughts but we're supposed to look to our savior and through his teachings and through and through the gospel to understand what the truth is because the world's going to spread all kinds of stuff that's not the truth and we have to use, use the gospel and scripture to understand what the truth is. Treating others the way they treat us is a common urge that we must fight. In fact, that's something I hear all the time. I've heard that for so many years, it becomes just treat others the way you're treated. I've had students say to me, well, I'll show respect when respect's given to me. That's not what that's saying. That is not what that's saying. And I said, that's kind of, I've told a student one time, I said, well, I said, you're chasing something that may, you may never achieve. You may never achieve that, chasing that, that statement. You've got to first be mindful of showing respect in order to get respect. You have it reversed. It's a challenging thing that the Lord asks us to do, to try to, turn the other cheek, to try to be charitable towards others, to try to help others. And guess what? He knows we won't be perfect at it. He knows we won't be thoughtful at, all the time, and we won't be kind all the time. He knows that. But he wants us to try. He wants us to try the effort. I always tell students this when I'm teaching. I say, guess what? Effort and attitude, two things you got to have. you got to have effort, and you have to have a good attitude. Two things. You control those. Effort, your effort and your attitude. He wants us to try. He wants us to try every single day. And when we fail, he wants us to continue to try, to not give up. That's why, this law, that's why Jesus is pleading with the lawyer at the end of this parable by saying, go and do likewise. Now, it doesn't really sound like pleading, but when I become an adult, I could hear that. That he is saying, go and do this. Go and do it. He's not saying, yeah, you know, it's an option. It's maybe an option for you. Maybe you could go out and try it. He's saying, go and do it. This is what Jesus wants us to do. He wants us to have compassion. He wants us to be aware of his intense desire for us to be happy, but also to show compassion to others, to love others, to love our neighbors, to have that energy, to have the devotion to him as a savior, and to be willing to go out and tell others that he died on a cross for, for our sins. He wants us to have that compassion. He wants us to be willing to get out of our comfort zone and stop and help. And when we do help, to tell them, I'm helping you because I am a Christian, that I have a Savior that died for me, and therefore I need to be doing something to help others because he, through his teachings, he told us this is what we need to be doing. We need to tell others about Jesus Christ. He wants us to do everything within his power to bring meaning and peace to our lives. 
He wants us to have some meaning in our lives, and that's telling others about Jesus. That doesn't mean we have to say, okay, I'm going to, here's, here's my schedule. No. Carl's shirt that says, are you my divine appointment? When he first put that on, he had that shirt. I'm like, hmm, that's a deep thought. You know, deep thoughts. I'm going, hmm. Because I think about how's people going to take that shirt? You know, I always, I always kind of playing two steps forward ahead of where he's at. Thinking, I wonder what people, and that's probably because I deal with high schoolers. Because I'm always thinking, how they, what are they going to think? <coughs> but then I started thinking a little deeper into that. Are you my divine appointment? That's a mindset. That's a mindset. In every opportunity, even if you're in the hospital, yeah. opportunity, you know, even if you're at the gas station, opportunity at your job, the way you approach things, people are going to look at, they're either going to look at like, there's something different about you or you're just like the world. You are just like the world. Tell others about Jesus. We have to. We have to be caring and we have to be show compassion. Seeing seeing things in this world tries to bring us down. I spoke about struggles. It's kind of been one of those things like a month and a half ago spoke about Jonah and Nineveh going and telling the gospel. Spoke about the struggles. Now we're back talking about sharing the gospel and showing compassion to those that are hard to love. We've all got family members, friends, co-workers that live a, live a life, and as I mentioned earlier in this, that have mood swings. Sometimes they're spot on, and, and, and sometimes they're not. But we still have to show compassion to them. We, sh we need to tell them about Jesus. We need to tell them that he died for them and that they need to, to step up and follow him with all their heart, not just part of their heart, not just when it's convenient to their situation. I think too many times we, we see this, and I, I see this in other places that call themselves churches, where it's a conven being a Christian is a matter of convenience. In fact, in their services, they don't mention much about the lost, they don't mention much about repentance, they don't mention much about compassion, or they don't mention much about anything other than just celebrating, being almost like being at a concert. But here's the thing. We are a church that needs to make that, what is it, a local church with a global impact. I always get this wrong. Regional impact. Yeah. Vision for the world, thank you. I always get it all twisted around. That's why I'm not a PR guy for something. I'd always twist it around and be like, I guess we shouldn't buy that product. I would, I'd turn it around. But, but, but here's the thing. That's what we need to be. We don't want to be like the priests that walk by and just shrug their shoulders and say, eh, somebody else will deal with that. That's kind of what his attitude was, somebody else. Or, nah, whatever reason... That's not what Jesus was telling us. We need to be showing compassion to, to others. We need to show the love of Jesus Christ. The Lord reminds us of this reality, and, it, and he's asking us to reflect on it. We know that there are people in our jobs that don't know Christ. We know that. We know there are people in our families that don't know Jesus Christ. Now, we could be like the priest or the Levite and just walk on by, not say anything because we don't want to make waves. We don't want to do anything that's going to rock the boat. We don't want to, you know how it's going to be. This is my pre-Thanksgiving sermon, by the way. <laughs> don't, we know how it'll be if you mention that. You know, you, you can't talk about that because I won't say any names, Lacey. I won't say any names. She's getting ready. She, thinks she gets nervous. She's over there squirming, thinking, Here, here's where it just. But we have that. Every Thanksgiving we have that. We know people that we're going to approach that are lost. And we, and we don't show the compassion to tell them about Jesus. Where's our love? Do we really want them to die and go to hell? 
Are we not going to try to at least, I mean, if you see somebody drowning, aren't you at least going to try to throw them something? This is, this is the problem. This is what this parable is talking about, the indifference that people have towards somebody that's lost and hurt or injured. Two people had indifference. They strolled by one person, showed compassion, and went in above and beyond, but showed compassion. The difference that I have in perspective of this as a child is I just looked at it as being, there was this good Samaritan that did something really good for somebody. And as an adult, I see the indifference of the world going past somebody and one person following Jesus that's going to do what's right. That's the difference. But we have opportunities. We have opportunities every single day, especially this time of year. We've got many opportunities, especially around time of Thanksgiving, around Christmas. You will run into people that you know are lost. You will run into them. And you may have the opportunity to just say a few words, but those few words could mean the difference in their life forever. Amen. That's something we've got to, we've got to be mindful of. We have to be mindful of this. The Lord gives us dozens of opportunities every day, every single day, to have a positive effect on other people. Who's, who's your divine appointment? Who is the person that's your divine appointment for each day? We never know, but we have to assume that somebody is. We have to. We have just as many chances to favor ourselves instead of others in our life. In fact, we can be very self-centered. Who's our divine appointment? The Lord pleads with us at the end of the parable, go and do likewise. He doesn't say just kind of, just hang out, you know, when it's convenient. He says, go and do likewise. Go out there and do something for others. Do something. And when we do, we need to say, listen, I am a follower of Jesus Christ. Jesus has done this for me. That's a moment where we can witness. We don't have to go into something where they run away holding their, you know, we could, you got to, you know, you don't take the sledgehammer to them. You go up and you talk to them. Do something. Show compassion. That's the thing. Our actions reflect who our Savior is. Our actions. People know that we're different. You know, in this, there's also a thing that goes all the way back to Exodus in this parable. And it's basically what the thieves did about stealing. You should not steal. Do not take away. It all gets into the selfishness, though. Those people are selfish. We're selfish. We are. We fight that. Some of us are more selfish than others. But we have that tendency, that human instinct of our, who we are in our mood swings that we get into. Sometimes we just don't want to do anything. In this parable, the Lord explains the same truth in positive terms. The attitude displayed by the Samaritan is a, it's, it's a big attitude. It's a Christ-like attitude. The Lord teaches us to share our abilities and our time. Do we take the full advantage of sharing our abilities and our time for Jesus? Do we, are we just doing it when it's convenient or when it fits into our schedule? That's something I think it goes back to last week when I talk about, spoke about the struggle. We get so caught up in ourselves that we miss out on following Jesus. We're so caught up in who we are. This gets into the moods that I mentioned earlier on. We're all going to face days where we don't feel like getting up and doing much. In fact, when it gets colder, I don't want to get out of bed sometimes. I know. Um, but we're all going to face that. We just have to be mindful of that. We have to recognize that. And we also have to recognize the effect that we have on those around us. Now, I'm in a crazy position. Every day I have to kind of, I, I told 
I've told Lacey one time, I've told several people this, I said every day, I know this, that the, my attitude affects every single person that comes in. If I got 20 people coming in, if my attitude's a certain way, I can get that on to everybody in that room. Within the 45 minutes they're with me, they can start to be brought into that whole thing. So I have to be mindful of that. We need to be mindful of that with who we're around. Amen. We need to know that our attitude and the way we are is going to affect those that we're talking to. If we go in there and we have a joyful attitude, people around you are going to be joyful. It's going to be contagious. If we go in there with an attitude that's filled with a lot of hate or just a lot of grumpiness or just anything, they're going to start to feel that and it's going to bring them into that too. It is. If you smile a lot, that helps. But that's not everything. Smiling can just be just, just an outward sign. You actually have to display it through your actions, through your words. They will know we are Christians by our love and the, by, by the means of our affection that we show. We should be a comforter to those that are in pain, but we should also point them to the ultimate comforter, Jesus Christ, through our words and through our actions. Just like the Good Samaritan did, we should be setting the example. We should be wanting to help others. If you're struggling with any of that, don't worry and don't fear because you're not alone with that. That's why we have a Savior. That is why we have a Savior. We all struggle with this. Now, I would like to play, when I, when this parable, this whole thing, the Good Samaritan, I like to pretend in my mind that I am the Good Samaritan, that I would have stopped and helped. But in reality, who knows? I might have been the Levite, walking by, shrugging my shoulders, just like somebody else will do that. Somebody else are like to do that. I think we all look at ourselves as being the Good Samaritan, as being the, the Lone Ranger, the, the person that's going to rescue and save the person. But the, the truth is, we're just as likely to have been the, the priest or the Levite in this story. And many times, we probably are the priest or the Levite in this story. This morning, as musicians come, if you are lost, or if you are just in pain, the altar's open. There is a Savior that's bigger than anything and anybody on this earth and I'm glad that I have a savior that that is going to be my rescuer my deliverer when I have any type of troubles in my life 